Hello, everybody. Welcome. Uh, it is a disgustingly hot day out in California right now. And uh, uh, the day that I'm recording this, uh, the Young Justice Curb Law that I just did uh, has come out. And so I'm preparing this ahead of time for the weekend. And uh, if you didn't miss my completely obvious little tease at the end, uh, I'm joined by a first time guest uh, that I'm very, very happy to have that he uh, made some time to uh, be on the show with us today. Uh, the great, lovely, and talented Mr. Greg Weissman, who, if you don't know by name, you certainly know by his work. Uh, he is one of the uh, big, key, important minds behind uh, the creation of the Disney Gargoyle series, uh, the Spectacular Spider-Man series, Young Justice, and most recently, Star Wars Rebels, among many, many, many other things. Uh, Greg, thanks so much again uh, for, for joining today, and uh, how you been doing? I'm good. Thanks for having me on the show. Absolutely. Are you are you surviving in this plus 100 heat right now? <laughs> I am. I mean, I'm indoors in an air-conditioned building, so that helps a lot. You're very lucky, because I'm not right now, because otherwise you'd hear in the back of my recording, so I'm horrendously jealous. Um, so uh, to start off with, I'm going to bust the more generic kind of shit out of the way. I I'm not going to make you tell your like origin story of how you started uh, on everything, because, I don't know, everybody go read a Wikipedia article if you want to hear that. Um, I actually want to hear a little bit about um, some of the stuff that you've been up to in the last few years, um, because I know a lot of people know of you for your work on the shows that I just listed a second ago, but I also know that you uh, have your you know, fingers dipped in a whole lot of different things, a lot of different shows in a lot of different ways. Uh, so what's a, a few things that you've been up to in the last like, few years? Uh, well, after Young Justice, as you mentioned, I uh, produced, I was one of the producers on the first season of Star Wars Rebels. Uh, after I uh, left Rebels, uh, Lucasfilm and Marvel asked me to write the Star Wars Kanan uh, comic book, so I did 12 issues of that. They're all out now. And then uh, part way through that, uh, Marvel asked me to write a uh, Star Brand and Nightmask series, um, which turned out to be a, a limited series. Um, so we did six issues of Star Brand and Nightmask, which was a lot of fun. I'm very proud of it. I did that with, I did the, Kanan with Pepe Laras, and I did uh, Starbrand Nightmask with Domo Staten, and both books turned out really great from my point of view. I'm biased, obviously, but, uh, you know, um, terrific artists, and that was a lot of fun. For the last year, I've been working on a, a preschool show over at Nick Jr. called Shimmer and Shine, which I, uh, I didn't work on season one, but season two premiered this past Wednesday. Um, and, uh, I did work on season two and we're currently working on season three. And, um, I think the show's a lot of fun. Obviously it's a preschool show. It's not necessarily designed for the same audience who watches Rebels or Young Justice, but, uh, you know, if you, you're a fan of those shows and you've got kids, I think it's a fun show to watch, uh, with your kids and, uh, I won't drive you crazy, um, <laughs> watching both now. And, uh, and then I've also got, these novels I've been writing. So I wrote uh, uh, two books in my book series, Reign of the Ghosts and Spirits of Ash and Foam. And these are two books about a, a young girl who lives on a chain of Caribbean islands called the Ghost Keys. And she lives and works at the bed and breakfast that her parents own. And she's just feeling kind of trapped. She feels like she'll graduate high school and just be stuck on these islands and nothing will ever happen to her. And she'll just be making beds for tourists and serving them breakfast and that will be her life for the rest of her life. And then she discovers that she can communicate with the dead, um, that she's got this heritage, that she's descended from the Taino Indians who were native to the Caribbean before Columbus showed up. And uh, she's got a mystery to solve and a destiny to fulfill. And so it's a, a really interesting book series that, that wraps sort of a modern uh, tourist economy reality with this great mythology of the Taino people, which has its own pantheon of gods and goddesses and its own great myths and stories, and which, you know, you know from a pop culture standpoint, no one's ever heard of. Mm -hmm. And so to me, it's been really great to sort of be able to do something with these great stories and these great characters and put it in a modern context. And so that's been a lot of fun. Um, and then we took the first book, Reign of the Ghosts, and we did an audio play version. Mm -hmm. um, but this isn't your standard audio book where it's just one guy reading the book out loud. This is a cast of 20 actors, including 
actors from Young Justice, Gargoyles, Spectacular Spider-Man, and other shows. Marina Sirtis, Brent Spiner, Ed Asner, uh, Josh Keaton, Steve Bloom, Vanessa Marshall, Jim Cummings, Jeff Bennett, Tom Adcox, uh, and that's not even half <laughs> of the cast there. Full musical score, uh, over three hours of original music by dynamic music partners who are the com- three composers who um, composed the music for Young Justice, for Spectacular Spider-Man, for Justice League Unlimited, for Avengers, various other cartoons, um, really talented people who um, brought their services to it, sound effects. So it's basically like a four-hour movie in your head. And folks can download that now on uh, gumroad.com slash reign of the ghosts. Gumroad is G-U-M-R-O-A-D dot com slash reign, R-A-I-N of the ghosts. And it's, I think, a a bargain. Um, And I really hope people check it out. And then I um, I, all of that as well in the description if you guys want to check that out. Um, yeah, that's wow, that's a start. <laughs> so, so much. Yeah, and there's there's making of videos at rainatthegosts.com, um, and and finally, um, last but not least, uh, I I've started working on the third book in the series, Mask of Bones, but kind of got interrupted because uh, Blizzard Entertainment Scholastic Books contacted me and. Um, they asked me to begin a book series for them. And the first book in that series, World of Warcraft Traveler, you know, the first novel in that series of books, uh, comes out uh, this November. So I, I just finished the third draft a week or so ago of the book. And, um, and it comes out uh, sometime in November, hopefully in time for BlizzCon in Irvine in November. Awesome. Yeah. Wow. What a start. Oh, my God. <laughs> so many things. Uh, I'm, I'm glad to hear. Uh, yeah, I saw that the Reign of the Ghost had a really successful like crowdfunding campaign. I saw the whole cast of people, and it looks uh, fantastic. So I have links to that in the description. Um, yeah, I'm assuming at some point you want, do you want to do that for uh, the following two books as well? Yeah, I, I uh, I'd love to do it for every book. I I don't really want to do the crowdfunding again, honestly. Um, I yeah. that was um, stressful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not a fun experience at all. We successfully crowdfunded, so I can't really complain too much, but it, mm-hmm. it's not quite what I thought it would be. Yeah, it's, And we're it's still a lot. struggling to fulfill all the rewards. I mean, the, the, the book is done, and, and I mean, the audio play is done, and, and it's there, and, and most of the rewards have been fulfilled, but there's a handful left that we have not been able to fulfill quite yet mm-hmm. for, due to circumstances that we couldn't predict or control. And we will, we absolutely will, but it's just become this sort of endless thing. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. And, uh, and I, I don't, and also it, uh, I, I just don't want to do the whole begging for money thing on an ongoing basis. It's okay that we tried it once, but, uh, sure, yeah. Uh, I, yeah, I count it, myself lucky. I had, I had no major issue. I, I did one on uh, GoFundMe, not Kickstarter uh, a few years ago and, uh, no, no problems to deal with, which, yeah, I count my lucky stars on that. Um, on, uh, so, so the reason I wanted to have you on, uh, in particular, uh, in addition to the fact that I, um, just recently marathoned through Spectacular Spider-Man, uh, and Young Justice, uh, pretty much back to back. Uh, so I'm an animation artist and I went to school for traditional animation and the, the types of shows that, that you and, and your teams and, and what different folks have worked on, this is the type of stuff that I really want to create. And I've been impatient and have gone ahead and tried to just do shit like that, you know, on my own, you know, doing stuff on YouTube and, and you know, just throughout the Internet and everything. Anyway, I moved out to California uh, now almost two years ago, uh, in about a week or two from now, um, and, uh, you know, to work out here in the industry. And uh, I've gotten the chance to meet a lot of folks like yourself who have worked on, you know, a billion different things in a billion different ways very similarly. Um, so I wanted to have you on to pick your brain about uh, most of all the the kind of conceptual process of what goes into making these shows. Um, so the first thing I wanted to start with uh, was so say I, I know that with the, a lot of the ones I mentioned at the beginning, uh, you've partnered with other people, artists and, and other writers and stuff uh, on the creation of the shows themselves. Um, so when you're conceptualizing a show idea and say you're working with your partner and anyone else heavily involved in the pre-production crew. Um, what type of stuff goes into the process of when you're building the main cast of characters 
and even like the recurring like the, the side characters and villains and things like that um well you know there's um characters that you come up with in the development phase of the of uh, pre-production and then there are characters that you come up with on an episodic basis um so those are sort of two different animals one is your mid-production and and you've got to keep that flow going or the whole production derails Mm -hmm. um uh but you know what you hope to get is enough time on the front end so that a lot of that stuff is uh that you know you're going to need is done already and the way I uh, do shows, usually we plan a whole season in advance. So in a very theoretical sense, you know, our character designers or uh, et cetera could look ahead and say, okay, these are the characters we're going to need. In in point of fact, though, um, there's never quite enough development time. <laughs> um, and so, you know, you wind up usually with your main cast, if you're lucky, a villain or two. Um, and maybe, you know, a couple supporting characters, but you basically wind up having to build your world episodically, even if you had it all planned in advance, because there are only so many man hours in a day. It's easy for me to say, and we're throwing in Vandal Savage. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, Phil Barassa has to draw the Young Justice version of Vandal Savage, and and it takes me two seconds to say that because I've been reading DC comics since I was in the womb or whatever. But, um, you know, so I just know the character and I say that, but then, you know, Bill has to actually draw it, um, come up with a design that he likes, that I like, that Brandon Vietti, my partner on the show likes. Um, and at least in theory, uh, although this was never a big problem, it has to get approved by DC comics as well. So, this process takes time. So even if Phil knows and we all know, well, we're doing the light. So we need the seven villains of the light. And we know that's Vandal Savage and we know it's Queen Bee and we know it's uh, um, Lex Luthor, et cetera. Um, so let's have those seven done in advance. Well, you know, the truth is we did do two or three of them in advance, but we didn't have time to do all seven in advance. Mm-hmm. So you sort of do them as, episodically you come uh you talked up a lot on them. about a uh, variety i think in another interview of like when you're deciding on even past just like young justice where like you have a lot of different pre-existing characters to choose from uh even on gargoyles it's like when you know it's all you know completely from your own head and you're picking like okay this is this is our lead hero and this is what his personality is like and this is what our leading lady is like and you know the the kind of comedy relief gang and etc like you know, when, when you're kind of assembling, you know, your seven to eight to however many, like, like the, the ones that are going to probably be in every episode. And you've done like a lot of these shows where like you're, you know, at the helm of like picking who's going to be who. Um, what is kind of your thought process on like the, on those kind of decisions? Well, I mean, Young Justice is a good example of that. You know, what I did first and foremost is uh, create a list um, partially from memory, but mostly through research mm-hmm. of all of DC Comics teenage heroes uh or even occasionally a teenage villain who i thought you know was kind of on the fence um or had potential and you know that list i mean i don't remember exactly but it was like 50 or 60 names Mm -hmm. um and obviously we're not going to have a regular cast of 60 we may very shortly have a recurring cast of 60 (laughs) Um, but we won't have a regular cast of 60 so you know you want to uh, first off, decide, okay, how many do we want? And, you know, and that could change, but the, the answer for us, I think was five or six. Mm-hmm. So we sat down and started Brandon Vietti and I had that list and we quickly reduced the number down to about a dozen who were really prime candidates for us. Um, and, um, you know, one of the ones that I really wanted to have some fun with was speedy slash arsenal slash red arrow. Um, But Brandon was really sort of fascinated with the Artemis character, and he was absolutely right, you know. Um, So we, you know, wanted to do those original Teen Titans from the 60s, which included the Dick Grayson Robin, the Wally West Kid Flash, our version of uh, Aqualad, Calderon, um, and uh, Roy Harper, Speedy. So, you know, that allowed us to sort of have Speedy be in the pilot, 
but have him reject the idea of being one of these teen sidekicks and and that so that allowed us to really focus on three characters, which is a nice small number to get to know initially their dynamics. Then we added in Superboy at the very end of episode one. We teased Miss Martian at the, well, not teased, but we were, you know, we didn't add Miss Martian until the very end of episode two. Um, and then we saved Artemis for uh, her introduction. We teased her in episode five, but we didn't have her come in until episode six. And um, that allowed us to sort of gradually introduce our six leads. Then once we had established those six leads, we in we brought in Zatanna in episode 15 as a guest star, had her guest two or three times before she joined the team in 19. Um, and then we teased Rocket in two or three episodes throughout the season and then brought her in in 25. And so, you know, by the time we were done, if you throw in Speedy slash Red Arrow, um, we had, you know, nine teenage characters Mm -hmm. who were important. And I would even say by episode 26, they were regulars. Um, But you don't have to introduce nine regulars up front, which is way too many for an audience to get to know. So, you know, we had a, a, a much more gradual introduction of these characters that I think worked pretty well. But in terms of choosing which characters, you know, what we wanted was a combination of characters with superpowers and characters who didn't have superpowers. They just had mad skills. Mm-hmm. We wanted a combination of we, we wanted those skills and powers to be diverse so that there wasn't a ton of overlap. You know, uh, Superboy's strong, and the truth is, so is Calderon. Um, And the truth is, when you throw in Miss Martian's telekinesis, she's got the equivalent of quite a bit of strength, too. But they're all characterized in different ways. And Calderon has her powers, his water bearers, etc. And Superboy has his vision powers. So there's a little overlap, but you don't want a ton of overlap in the superpowers. And we also, you know, want different personalities. So you have... Dick Grayson, who just loves what he's doing, you know, loves it so much that, you know, Batman's taught him that trick that Batman always pulls on Commissioner Gordon, where Commissioner Gordon's talking to Batman, and then when he turns around, he sees that Batman's vanished. And Robin knows how to do that, but he thinks it's so great, he can't help laughing. So you hear this sort of kid laughter out somewhere um, all the time. So you had that sort of, we wanted a range of ages. They're all teenagers, but, you know, in terms of our six leads, they range in age from uh, 13 to 16. Red Arrow's a little older. He's 18, but um, uh, it's that kind of range in there. We wanted a range of personalities, but we also specifically were looking for characters. Um, One of the themes of the show was secrets and lies, so we were looking for characters who uh, were telling lies, were keeping secrets, or were having secrets kept from them. Mm -hmm. Um, so Miss Martian, Artemis, Superboy, that really fit that were, need. You were talking uh, also, I think, in another interview about how uh, Robin's like uh, what the the unword uh, kind of quirk with him of like the the whelmed and mm-hmm. underwhelmed and all that was coming from like a real conversation you had with your kids, which I I thought was hilarious because uh, I I always love little things like that that come from like real interactions with people. Um, obviously, for like you know characters that that are you know these these big legacy characters from like you know all these major comic series and movie series and things um you know you have plenty to work off of when you're making a new character from the ground up um you know like the caster gargoyles or like you know i'm assuming some of the new characters from star wars rebels um you know like do you do you often have like real people that you know from your life that like often work as like the model for like the person's, you know, kind of state of being or like little quirks or things like that. Is that, is that kind of where you get inspiration for that or is it from other sources? Well, I'm sure it is. Um, but I try not to, I, I'm not looking to sort of say, Hey, uh, hair is based on my mom <laughs> um, or, uh, Sabine's my sister, you know, um, that kind of thing. And then by the way, I didn't create either of those two characters. Uh, by the time I got aboard on rebels in season one, those, all the the six leads and and the inquisitor were already there part of the show i mean what my job was 
was to, you know, we knew the basics, but we needed to flesh those backstories out. We needed to be able to give the writers the backstories. We needed to be able to give the actors their backstories. Um, for example, we needed to give them all last names. When I came aboard, none of those characters had last names. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, in the Star Wars universe, those characters would have last names. So we came up with them. Uh, I came up with a couple other people did, but the point was, it's like, let's flesh these characters out. Let's figure out what their histories are, that sort of thing. Um, and so in that sense, you're borrowing from everywhere and anywhere, but you're also just trying to be, uh, create a sort of internal logic. One of the things on Gargoyles, for example, that was really important is we didn't just want these guys to be humans with wings. Mm-hmm. We wanted their, the, they had a gargoyle culture informed by, by gargoyle biology and what was unique about them beyond, you know, because they still, talk and they still you know interact and they and obviously we're human beings they're going to have human interaction even though they're gargoyles but because what else would we write (laughs) Um, but 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 it but you want culturally to have these differences this idea that naming is a human concept and that uh the humans either name them or at some point they chose names for themselves as adults or as young teenagers, because the naming thing becomes addictive. And that was one of the things we tried to do in Cargoyles, was this idea that naming is addictive, um, but that, it, that there's a sense that sometimes naming something limits it. Mm-hmm. Um, and that the Gargoyle way was never to do that, that, you know, what your brother called you, what your lover called you, what, you know, the kids who look up to you call you what the old man calls you. Those would, in theory, be different names. Mm-hmm. And you're defined by your specific relationships to these people, not by one name that somehow limits who you are to all these people. Mm-hmm. Um, but that the problem with that is that naming is addictive. So that once the gargoyles get started naming, they, those names stick in almost immediately. <laughs> uh, and that's just an example. We did, you know, the way they raise children. There were all sorts of things that we tried to think in terms of uh, what gargoyle biology is and how gargoyle biology would inform gargoyle culture. And then what happens during the, the culture clash between human culture and gargoyle culture? What parts do the gargoyles preserve? What parts do they assimilate, um, et cetera? Mm-hmm. And those may seem like pretty highbrow, high tone kind of considerations for a cartoon show but um that's what gives that show in particular its depth um you know it's not just a surface show about a bunch of colorful characters flapping their wings and going around the city fighting crime it's about these strangers in a strange land so to speak and that means that they need backstories they need a culture, they need a biology that's inherently consistent. Mm -hmm. Um, Likewise, even on a show like Young Justice, one of the things that um, both Brandon and I set out to do quite intentionally was um, in parts to differentiate the show from uh, other DC superhero shows that had come before is we really wanted to ground this show in reality. Um, So we did, you know, Brandon and Phil did things like, you know, Brandon's big thing um, was he didn't want it to look like all the superheroes and supervillains all shopped at the same store for their costumes. <laughs> so, you know, we wanted the costuming to be very specific to the individual. Mm-hmm. You know, who needs padding to armor? Who needs uh, freedom of movement? You know, that kind of thing. We wanted all that to be very um, specific so that it grounded the series. That's why we did timestamps with dates and with places and and dates and times all the time, because that was another way to sort of ground it in reality, which we felt was important, A, because, you know, we're doing a superhero show that has uh, science fiction aspects and magic and fantasy aspects and all this stuff that'll yank you out of reality. We wanted that to come from a place of grounding Mm -hmm. so that that stuff seems special and not just, yeah, the world's weird. Um, And then again, the second reason why that was important to us was that the shows that had preceded us, um, that wasn't their bent. Mm-hmm. So one of the things we were doing is 
We didn't want to be competing with Teen Titans or Justice League Unlimited. We wanted to be going a different direction with it. Not better, just different. Um, and then the third thing was, is, uh, you know, for us, the show was fundamentally not a superhero show. Or it was, but, you know, it was first and foremost a spy show, mm-hmm. um, not a superhero show. And second, it was a show about teenagers coming of age. And third, it was a superhero show. So that was definitely an aspect of it. I'm not trying to walk that back, but mm-hmm. um, it was definitely in third position behind uh, spies and teens. So, um, and that was, again, stuff that we did to distinguish it from what had come before. Uh, well, it did. Yeah, absolutely. I, I was talking about on the, the solo uh, vlog I did before this about, um, you know, I grew up loving Teen Titans and, and Justice League. Uh, and I love this show just as much, and I feel like it is completely differentiated in its own kind of way. Um, kind of uh, spinning off of what you mentioned about the, you know, keeping the continuity between everything and, and mapping it out. Um, my, originally, the next question I was going to ask was basically amounting to, do you like anime? And then I realized, like, oh, he's directed anime. Oh, he's worked on anime. No shit. <laughs> so, um, but before... Uh, before the kind of twofold strike of Pokemon and Dragon Ball Z happened in the late 90s, there were very, very few uh, animated shows at all, uh, in, in, of which included um, the likes of Gargoyles and like Batman animated series and stuff like that, that had a, uh, a consistent story that you could follow from episode to episode, um, obviously still having each individual episode be treated as its own thing that you could watch without knowing everything. Um, but just the thing that I've noticed about uh, all of these series that I've watched is that they they all have like you like if you are paying attention like if you're investing yourself into it, uh, it pays off. And I I always kind of grew up thinking like that you know uh, American cartoon producers, which obviously that's changed very very much now. But at the time I thought like they just were too afraid that kids wouldn't have the attention span or like wouldn't care enough or would be too difficult. Was was kind of the drive to want to do that because you've consistently done that in in almost all your shows to have like a plot that you could follow the entire way through and then having these big stories mapped out. Was that kind of inspired by like, were you an old school anime fan? Did that come more from, from just reading comics? Like any, is there any kind of correlation between that? It's not really anime. And I think by the way, it's a fair question to ask if I uh, uh, watch anime because the truth is I don't much. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. I did direct three by three eyes and I voiced in numerous I've done voice work in numerous anime projects mm-hmm. and I'm open to doing more, but I'm not one of those guys who watched a ton of anime. You know, when I was a kid, um, you know, uh, I, there were only where I lived, there were only a couple of shows that came on and, um, you know, things like Kimba and speed racer. Yeah. And in my day, no one said, Oh, anime. Right. I mean, I'm really old, <laughs> you know, I hadn't heard the term anime until, you know, I was in my late twenties, you know? Um, and then people would say, Oh yeah, Kimba, that's anime. And I'd be like, it is. Oh, well then, yeah, I've watched anime. Um, speed racer anime. Oh, okay. Yeah. Then I've watched anime, but I didn't know that at the time. I'll also say that, you know, you said just a, a slight correction, but you said producers didn't think the kids could follow it. And my guess is it was almost never the producers and almost always the network executives. Right. Um, yeah, I and yeah. um, my guess is the producers were like, hey, let's do this. And the executives were like, no. Right. Um, yeah. <laughs> but for me, the, the bigger influences were definitely comic books and frankly, soap operas. I mean, I watched all my children um, since the 70s um, until, and then even when I stopped watching it because, you know, I worked for a living. Um, you know, I was following recaps, um, in the newspaper originally, and then online of what went on. I followed all my children until it went off the air. Um, and probably more important than any of that stuff is the television series, Hill Street Blues, which was a major influence on me and like a huge revelation because it combined what I loved about comics and, uh, soap opera and that kind of thing, that kind of serialization with an episodic but sequential format and with by telling stories that mattered. Um, And some of the comics I read did that as well. And occasionally even the soap operas did that, but, but Hill street did it all the time. 
Um, and I, you know, to me, modern drama doesn't exist without Hill Street Blues. Yeah. There's no Breaking Bad without Hill Street Blues. There's no Sopranos without Hill Street Blues. There's no St. Elsewhere. There's no ER. There's no House. None of that exists without Hill Street Blues blazing an immense trail. Right. And so for, you know, if any of your listeners haven't watched Hill Street Blues, they are missing out. And the, you know, and I have not, I don't get any money for this, but I would recommend, you know, a, uh, what's it called? I want to say, uh, Shout. Yeah. Um, Shout put out the complete series on DVD and I recommend it highly. But that was a huge influence on Gargoyles mm -hmm. um, and thus a huge influence on everything that followed. I mean, I, I love Batman the Animated Series and I can't say enough good things about it, but I will say there is one way that Gargoyles was groundbreaking in a way that Batman the Animated Series was not. And that's that, yes, every episode stood alone, but our episodes were sequential. You could tune into an episode, enjoy the story of that episode but you gained more from the show by watching them in order. Right. And for, to a large extent, that wasn't, that didn't matter on Batman, the animated series. And again, that's not a criticism. It's just a fact. Yeah. Yeah. It didn't matter which order you watched those episodes. And, and there's some exceptions to that, but largely that's true. Yeah. And again, I want to be clear. I love Batman, the animated series and Gargoyles would not have existed if Batman hadn't blazed the trail to show Disney executives that, hey, you can do an action drama and not get killed in the ratings. Right. You know, uh, they wouldn't have had the courage to give the green light to Gargoyles if Batman hadn't come first. Right. But I do think that we were a different kind of show in a lot of ways. Um, people talk about how dark Gargoyles was, but I don't think it was a dark show, um, both literally and figuratively. It was a show full of optimism. It was a show full of color. They were rich, deep colors, purple, magenta, blues, reds, etc. because most of our episodes took place at night. Right. But, you know, Batman was visually dark mm -hmm. with browns and blacks and grays, and that wasn't us. Um, we had a lot of color. We had a lot of humor to the show, a lot of romance to the show. And again, that's not better or worse, but I want to make the point that it's different. Yeah, and, and I think the reason that a lot of people probably made that comparison is because, like I was saying, there were so few, there were so few shows like that, like that were animated series that were like that could like that could be serious, that could have action drama kind of stuff. So I think that people were just like, oh, it's like it's kind of like this other thing is like what else is there to think of? And now that like you know animation isn't um, considered as much as a, a, of a single genre, it, it is it is a medium. And I would think more people are aware of that now. I think in hindsight, people can look back on Gargoyles and not just be like, oh, it was Disney's answer to the Batman series. Like, no, it, it completely holds up as its own thing. And, and you know, well, it, I mean, in, in many ways, it, it was Disney's answer to the Batman series. I'm not trying to dodge that. Mm -hmm. um, but but yes, it, I do think it holds up on its own. And I do think there were significant differences in tone and presentation and everything. But the main thing to answer your original question is mm -hmm. Gargoyles and every other show that I've been a producer of, um, that is where I've hold, held a real position of authority. Mm -hmm. um, what I do on all those shows is I do the kind of stuff that I want to see. I have to be passionate about it because my theory is, is that if, if myself and the people working on the show aren't passionate about it, if we don't love it, then how is anybody watching it supposed to be passionate about it. Mm -hmm. Our passion needs to shine through in the episodes so that the people watching the show feel that passion and share it. Um, and so Gargoyles specifically, this was the show that I wanted to make because this was the show that I wanted to see mm -hmm. that I, the kind of show that I've been wanting to see my, I don't know, my whole life, but basically, you know, since I was, sentient <laughs> you know, um, you know it, it that was the kind of um show i wanted one that had continuity one that had a memory one of the things that frustrates me about any show or any continuity is when 
if I can remember the details and the people making it should be able to remember the details, mm-hmm. you know? And, uh, so when continuity got ignored, um, that was always a very frustrating thing to me because it's like, wait a minute, you created this. This must have mattered to you. So why are you contradicting it here? Yeah. And sometimes it's fine to subvert that on purpose. That is, oh, you thought you knew what happened back in episode three, but here's, we did that a lot on Spectacular Spider-Man, for example. You know, you thought you knew who the Green Goblin was. Guess what? No, you know, <laughs> um, and I, I was fooled. <laughs> Well, and that's great, you know, and I'm sure there was a percentage of the audience that was fooled, a percentage of the audience that was confused, a percentage of the audience that guessed where we were going with it. Mm -hmm. But for us, what was important is that we played fair. We planted the clues so that in hindsight, looking back, um, when you get to episode 26, you look back at episode nine and go, oh, my God, of course. (laughs) And that's what you want. You want them to be both surprised but surprised in a way that they go, oh, of course, right. as oh, opposed yeah. to surprised in a way where they go, how did that happen? I don't, yeah. you know, that makes no sense. You want them, you want that, that, that double barreled thing of shock and inevitability yeah. um, to, to hit the viewer. And so you plant the clues, you play fair, um, but you try and make the clues subtle enough that people don't notice them at the time, but they're, at episode 26, or if they're rewatching the series a second time from the beginning, they sit there and they go, oh, my God, they planted that seed, you know, back there. Yeah. And people are always asking me, did you do that on purpose? And I'm like, yeah, of course I did that on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, you know, it's an accident, guys. <laughs> well, you know, accidents do happen. I mean, uh, but, you know, when you're doing that kind of thing, it's on. It's definitely on purpose. I mean, look, on Gargoyles, when we did the pilot, um, we had Vikings attacking the Scottish castle in the year 994. Mm-hmm. Well, we chose Scotland because we wanted to uh, help the suspension of disbelief in terms of the language barrier. In other words, the truth is, is that no one in Scotland was speaking English. Um, but they speak English there today, so it wasn't a big leap. If we had set it on a French cathedral, mm-hmm. people would be wondering, why aren't they speaking French? Right. Um, uh, but in Scotland, we could make that work. Um, you know, the suspension of disbelief was just a little less. Um, and we chose Scotland instead of England because Scotland is further north and, and, uh, and so gives the impression, particularly to American audience, of being less civilized in the Middle Ages. Right. And so that's why we chose Scotland. We chose 994 because the show was premiering in 1994, so it was a thousand years. So that's a n- nice round number. That's the only reason we chose 994. Right. We chose Vikings because Vikings are cool. <laughs> and that's the only reason we chose Vikings. And that's all you need. <laughs> after the fact, after we had done that, committed to it, we looked it up and found out that, lo and behold, Vikings had been attacking the west coast of Scotland in that era. We had gotten it right completely by accident. But having done that, that happy accident, I then determined, all right, now let's do our research ahead of the game instead of after the fact. I want us to be as accurate as possible within the realm of, okay, yeah, we were throwing gargoyles and magic and all sorts of things in this, but I want the history to be as accurate as it possibly can be. So we researched the history, for example, of the historical Macbeth as opposed to Shakespeare's Macbeth. Mm-hmm. We researched the history of all these Scottish kings and found these incredible stories that we could adapt from true history. And we got a lot of great stuff out of that. And all of that came out of the happy accident of us choosing Scotland 994 and Vikings mm-hmm. and then finding out that we were right by accident. <laughs> Going back to, uh, you were talking about Green Goblin also, by the way, and, and this is uh, part of the reason why uh, I also asked about the, oh, like, was anime an influence on you at all? Um, even back when Spectacular Spider-Man was first airing, uh, and Ben Diskin, who says hi, by the way, can tell you, I have a walking, talking encyclopedia of voiceover bullshit, and I was noticing, like, wow, there's a lot of people in, in this show, uh, and then also in Young Justice, that were people that started uh, their voiceover careers in anime, you know, people like 
like Steve Bloom, Kristen Freeman, Yuri Lowenthal, who's who I've worked with before, uh, you know, Kari Walger and people like that. Uh, which I was really happy about because I was hearing even back then for a while there was like almost like this shadow hierarchy of like oh if you do anime you're not a real actor or whatever and then I was seeing all these people like ascend and getting in all these shows which was awesome and then and then also seeing uh, little clever things like uh, the little quick episode where Black Spider shows up in Young Justice and it's Josh Keaton coming out I'm just like I get it ha or um, I think there's an episode where. I think it's like what it's Tom Adcox, Ed Asner, uh, Jeff Bennett, and I, I. I don't. Keith wasn't in that episode, but I'm assuming it was. Like, oh, it's it's the cast of Gargoyles all together in this Young Justice episode. Hmm. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, you worked with uh, Jamie Thomason on. I, I think all of these shows, if I'm right. Uh, what with with all these kind of clever things like that. What 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 is kind of the the casting pro like is that is that a lot of fun like what what kind of you have little clever things like that planted in there too like what what is that whole kind of process like well like we were talking about the difference between development and and production there's a similar thing going on here um network studio execs etc they want to have a voice no pun intended in the choosing of regular cast mm -hmm. so what that means is for the regulars major players, for example, that included Green Goblin on Spider-Man, mm -hmm. we had auditions. And so um, I've known Christian Freeman for years and years, mm -hmm. um, going uh, back to before I'd ever worked with him. He was a friend of a friend. And um, and again, I'm not going to pretend to think I'm not familiar with. I, I know Crispin has had and continues to have a stellar career not only in regular voiceover i don't even know what that means regular voiceover but in anime as well mm -hmm. i guess american and and dubbing um i didn't know him from that i knew him as a, this good guy mm -hmm. you know who was a friend of a friend of mine who i'd gotten to know at a, at a convention i knew that he could do a great bill foggerbach imitation um <laughs> uh, but you know I'm not going to hire him to do that on a show. I'll hire Bill Fockerbocky and get the <laughs> real thing, you know? Um, so, uh, but I, you know, knew he was talented and, and that sort of thing. So, you know, when I, I did a show called Witch, um, and uh, in the last episode, uh, we were hoping to get a third season, and we wanted in the very last episode to introduce two of our antagonists for uh, what would have been season three, which we didn't end up getting. Um, and so I brought Crispin in to do uh, those two characters. Um, and they were really just a tease for a season that never came. And then on Young Justice, Crispin auditioned. Um, you know, he auditioned uh, for that on, uh, I guess, Spider-Man came first. And so, in any event, my point is, is that, you know, Steve auditioned for uh, Green Goblin and won the role. Crispin auditioned for Superboy and didn't win the role, but he was really good in the audition. He was one of the finalists for that, and we thought he'd be really good to play all the various Harper characters on Young Justice. Mm -hmm. um, and so, a lot of times, uh, you've got to distinguish between the audition process and what comes after. So, for example. We auditioned, obviously, held auditions for the role of Spider-Man slash Peter Parker on The Spectacular for Spider-Man. Mm -hmm. And for me, for uh, my partner on the show, Vic Cook, for Jamie Thomason, who was our voice director, we all three felt that the obvious choice was Josh Keaton. Mm -hmm. um, and I went into a meeting with uh, Sony and Marvel executives almost, I'm going to say with a chip on my shoulder, ready to fight for Josh to win that role. And, um, you know, we sit down with all these people and they're like, okay, so who's your first choice for, for Peter slash Spidey? And I'm like, Josh Keaton. And I was ready for a fight. And everyone was like, yeah, he was our first choice too. <laughs> so I'm sitting here ready. I'm, I'm like, ready for this battle that doesn't come because everyone agrees that it should be Josh. Was that battle? Now, I, contrast I, I, that. I have to ask, was that, was that because you, were you expecting, like, all right, we want to get a celebrity or something, right? No, I wasn't expecting, I mean, you know, we had already narrowed it down to, I forget exactly, but I want to say somewhere between four and six actors. Um, uh, 
I don't particularly recall if one or the other was a celebrity. I was just ready for a fight because, I don't know, I just assumed they'd be dumb. I don't know what I was thinking. But the fact is, is everyone agreed. Now, contrast that with casting Josh's Black Spider on uh, Young Justice. Now, you got the joke. Good. We wanted you to. Um, but the fact also is, is that, again, we hold those auditions for the regulars at the beginning of the process in, in as part of that development process before a show goes into production mm-hmm. or pre-production. Um, but on an episodic basis, there isn't time to hold auditions for every single character that comes in. We, we'd never get through it. So at that point, it just becomes casting. It's about me and, in the case of Young Justice, Brandon Vietti, my partner on the show, and Jamie Thomason, the voice director, who's also our casting director, and sitting down and saying, okay, who are we going to need for the next episode? And I'm like, well, then we've got this assassin called the Black Spider. He's appeared once before, but he had no lines. So this is the first time we'll be hearing him talk. And Jimmy's like, okay, so what do you want? And I'm like, I want Just Keaton. What, what do you want him to, I, I want him to play Spider-Man. <laughs> Evil Spider-Man. That's what I want. I want, you know, the, the character was created at DC as a pastiche on Spider-Man. Mm-hmm. So why not just do that? I mean, you know, I wouldn't necessarily do it if he was a ongoing regular, but I wouldn't hesitate to bring the character back and have him do the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. Because it's funny, and it's fun, and it's a little wink to fans of Spectacular Spider-Man, but if you've never seen Spectacular Spider-Man, it still works in Young Justice. Mm -hmm. He's still a fun character for Young Justice, and an effective character for Young Justice. Whether or not you have any knowledge of who Josh Keaton is, whether or not you've ever seen or heard an episode of Spectacular Mm Spider-Man. And that's important. You know, it's one thing for me to have this little inside joke for the fan, but that can't be the only reason to do it. Mm -hmm. And that can't be the, um, done at the expense of the show you're working on at the moment. Certainly helps that Josh is a fantastic actor. (laughs) So, of course, um, but Josh can do a hundred different things. And we were saying to him, I don't want you to do a hundred different things. I want you to do Spidey except he's evil and he's older because mm-hmm. Peter and our show was, was a uh, 15 or 16. And obviously black spider was a guy in his probably late twenties or something like mm-hmm. that. We want him a little older. We wanted him evil, but otherwise I'm basically saying, I want you to play Spider-Man here. Um, two notes, older, evil, does the Spider-Man voice, but puts it through the prism of those two, two notes. And in a second, you've got an, a new character that's a ton of fun. Um, that's a wink to certain people, but works fine in the Young Justice context. So, in the last uh, few months since all of Young Justice became available, there has been uh, a lot of the news reports about the possibility of getting a third season if there is enough demand for it. Um, I know what all of your notes have been uh, on, you know, how this is possible to get it to be a thing in the first place, uh, but. In just even recently, I was like, I, I uploaded the uh, the Young Justice Curb blog that I did recently, and I was seeing in the comments, like, even still, people didn't even know, oh, what can I do? Um, so I want to also have this as a separate thing of just uh, please, black and white, the 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 ways that you can that anybody out there can support uh, Young Justice to get money in Warner Brothers and Netflix and D- and DC Comics's pockets to show, hey, people want more of this. What can we do? Okay, so I'm glad you asked. It's an important question because I think the possibility is very real that we could get a third season. I, this is not me blowing smoke. I truly believe it's possible. I want to be clear. I've got no guarantee. I don't even work at Warner Brothers anymore. I work at, at Nickelodeon. But I've had a couple conversations with the folks at Warner Brothers and even a conversation with some folks at Netflix. And I have a basic understanding of how this works. Mm-hmm. So what I'm offering isn't a guarantee, but it's a viable strategy. It's something that is real that can help us get a third season of the show. Um, And the thing to keep in mind is why the show was not continued in the first place. Mm -hmm. And it's a very simple equation. I've seen all sorts of rumors and stuff on the internet. I debunk them as off. I debunk the same damn rumors over and over again on the internet. But the actual truth is very straightforward. I'm sure there were other little complications involved, 
but they were minor compared to the big thing, which was that the budget for the show was paid for by money we received from Mattel in exchange for the toy license. When the toy line for Young Justice failed, and you could have a whole eight-hour discussion on why it failed, but yeah. that's not that's so beside the point, it doesn't matter. Yeah. When the toy line failed, the money from Mattel stopped coming in. There was no money to make the show, and it's that simple. And why that's important, why it's not some conspiracy or why it's not it had the wrong audience or any of those things. Right. The reason it's important to know why it was canceled is because that's the key to figuring out how to bring it back, which means what can we do to pay for the show in a different way? Right. The answer to that is you want to demonstrate specifically to Warner Brothers, but also to a number of companies that sort of hover around uh, or divisions that hover around Warner Brothers animation, that there are alternative ways to pay for the show. So first and foremost, what I'm asking people to do it's hashtag keep binging YJ. Um, and that first hashtag is mostly about Netflix. Mm-hmm. Netflix had season one of Young Justice up for quite some time without having season two. But as of February 1st of this year, they put season two up, which is great. And I began this campaign to have people start binge watching Young Justice on Netflix. The thing people need to keep in mind is this is a marathon, not a sprint. They can't just binge watch it, you know, at some point someone put up a thing, let's all, on Valentine's Day, let's all binge watch the show. And so they got huge, you know, they were trending on Netflix for Valentine's Day. And then when it was over, it was like, okay, did we get the show back? And I'm like, who said Valentine's Day was important? You know, it's great that you guys did that, but that's not the answer. The answer is we need those numbers to stay big. We need them to be Netflix and Warner Brothers to see in a way that affects their bottom line that people are watching the show and are and therefore would watch a third season. So we want that. You know, if you have Netflix already, this is a really inexpensive way to help us out. Just binge the show. Hell, for all I care, turn it on and leave the room. Go do the dishes. I don't care. Just set it so that it keeps watching the episodes one after another, every three episodes or so you come back and say, yes, you know, keep watching more. But the key is, is we've got to keep those numbers high for a long ongoing basis. I don't have some kind of magic. Well, if we just get this many views, that'll be enough. I don't have that number. I don't know that number. I don't know that that number exists. We just want on an ongoing basis to demonstrate that this show is love and that if Netflix puts it on for a third season, if they pay for a third season, they will be rewarded with lots and lots of viewers. Mm-hmm. You can also binge watch it on iTunes. That helps too, because that money from iTunes goes into Warner Brothers pocket and Warner Brothers will see, ah, oh, we can make money doing more of these. But the key is watch it over and over again. Second way. Buy the Blu-rays and or the DVDs. Um, don't buy them used because then Warner Brothers doesn't see the money. You got to buy them new so that Warner Brothers gets their chunk of it every time a sale is made. That way, Warner Brothers Home Entertainment goes to Warner Brothers Animation and says, wow, the DVDs and Blu-ray sales on Young Justice are fantastic. We'd like some more of these. And that encourages Warner Brothers Animation to say, well... Are you going to pay for part of it? And if the number's big enough, Home Entertainment says, yeah, we will. They pay for a little of it. And that's another way Warner Brothers says, okay. The other thing to keep in mind is that um, Warner Brothers owns the show. DC Comics owns the characters. Now, of course, they're both divisions of Time Warner. But you want both divisions to want there to be more episodes. So one great way to do that is to buy the, we did a bunch of companion comics for Young Justice. They're in continuity. The writers who wrote Young Justice, mostly me, um, wrote the stories. A um, couple of great artists, first Mike Norton for uh, uh, four or five issues, and then Christopher Jones did great work on that book. And we did about 25, 26 issues of companion comics. They have time stamps just like the series had. So you can even figure out exactly where they fall between episodes. 
They tell stories that were missing from the series because we didn't have enough episodes to tell them. They introduce some new characters. They give you more information about old characters, backstory, all this great stuff. Buy those on Comixology or iTunes because every time you do that, money goes into DC Comics pockets. And DC goes, wow, this Young Justice thing's still doing well for us three years later. We should encourage Warner Brothers Animation to make more. And we'll make more comics. And you want that. Now, I'd love to be able to tell people, go to your local store and buy the books there. I'm an old-fashioned guy myself. As you know, I can't even figure out how to do Skype. Uh, and I really love the feel of a comic book or a trade in my hand. But the fact of the matter is, is that all those books are out of print. So if you're buying them in a store, you're buying them as a second sale. And so Warner Brothers, DC Comics, they won't see a dime. So I would say go to the store and buy the hard copies because they're worth having. But what I need you to do is buy them on Comixology or on iTunes as e-comics so that that money portion of it goes right into DC Comics bottom line. Those are the three ways. The DVDs are Blu-rays, but the e-comics and the binging on Netflix or iTunes. Those are the three real ways that we can affect things. And what I will say is that it seems to have had an effect. I don't have any inside information, but it's clear that Netflix and Warner Brothers are at least having a conversation. I don't know if we're close. I don't know if we're far away. But the fact that they're talking at all, that's promising. So it's working. But again, it's a long haul. It's a marathon. It's not a sprint. So we need people to continue to do this. We need them to show the show to friends, you know, so that if they've already bought the Blu-rays and DVDs, then their friends will buy them. If they've already read the comics, then their friends will read them. If they've already seen the show, then their friends will start binging the show as well. So we need converts. And all this stuff, I think, is a real, legit way for us to get a third season. Because I'll tell you this, I've you know, there's no one at Warner Brothers who's sitting there saying, we didn't like that show. We don't want to make it anymore. They'd love to make more. They just need to know that they're not going to get economically burned by doing it. So that's my rant on that subject. No, not, not at all. And I, and I want to add to that, uh, to any and all of you out there listening to this, whether you're a subscriber or if you just happen to find this through whatever other connection, um, if you have not already seen Young Justice and you've been hearing the buzz about this kind of popping around on news sites and stuff, I highly, highly, highly implore you check it out. Uh, if you already have a Netflix account, it is it is free to watch the whole thing on there. The whole all two seasons are on it. It's a fantastic show. Um, and if you have already seen it, then do all of that. If if you are able to do all of that, even at, at the bare minimum, if you can, what he was saying before, just have it on in the background. I'm doing that. I am doing that right now. I'm having episodes on in the background. To, cause it's, it's not just, you, you watch it the one time, it's, oh, it's over, where's my show? No, you have to keep doing it. The, the more support you can lend, the better. If you can get new copies of the DVDs or Blu-ray sets to own a copy of them for yourself as well, do that. If you can get the e-comics from Comixology, do that. I'm gonna have links to all of that stuff. Any and all of that, it is support. There's, there's no Kickstarter. There's no petition that's gonna do anything about this. These are, as Greg was saying, real ways that you can get this to happen. The fact that these conversations are going on and things have changed with, you know, shows getting picked up for digital distribution, you know, if it, if it is lucrative, because I know that you've said this before too, I'm stealing this quote, but uh, animated series don't get put into a magical funnel or whatever and they just happen. They're funded. They, are, they have to happen through lots and lots and lots of money to pay the tons and tons of people that work on them all of the animators, all the board artists, all the writers, all the actors, all the producers and directors and everybody, that's how it happens. And this is how you basically can, you yourself can more or less be funding the prospect of this continuing on. And, you know, I mean, even, even if it were just like another season, I know that you have plans for doing, you know, far more than that if, if possible, but even if it were another season, I want to see, as a, as a newer fan, I only just recently finished watching through this. I want to see more with these characters. I want to see more of what you and your crew had planned for this, uh, you know, for, for going forward. And so anybody and everybody out here listening to this, please do any and all that. I'll have links to all of the stuff where you can get it legally to buy it and, and watch, et cetera. 
uh, in the description below. And and yeah, and even spread this. If if you've been seeing people around talking about like, oh, I wish that show would come back, and they don't know the the, the score of what's going on, link them this video or, or or otherwise, or just spread the information out there. Show them the show if they haven't seen it. Do anything you can to because you know this this is this is the actual chance that you have. This is what you have to do to make that happen. So that's that's my post rant to your rant. <laughs> Greg, I really appreciate you uh, taking your time out. Seriously, this is I, like I said, I have a billion more questions that I would I would love to ask you more about. Uh, but uh, we can do this again sometime. We oh, can. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Seriously. You know, you know what? Actually, I will. Uh, what I'm going to do is because it's been so long since I've seen Gargoyles, and now off the heels of this, I'm going to I'll call you back when I when I watch through that show because I would I would love to um, you know delve more into your to your your own original stuff that you know you did with 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 the, the crew back in the day as well. Which, speaking of which, I'll also have a link to where you can pick up uh, Reign of the Ghosts. Uh, I recommend everybody do that. Uh, really, really quick question before you head off. Uh, last little thing. Um, of all the stuff that you've done, if there are any, like, one or two couple particular characters that are your all-time favorites that, like, either just made you laugh or made you cry or, like, that, that had, like, a really big impact on people, anything from Gargoyles, Young Justice, Spectacular Spider-Man, anybody, any personal favorites that you really liked? Well, you know, uh, in a way, I think of them all as kind of my kids, and so I don't, you know, I'm not, I'm not really big on ranking them. Um, you know, for me, Goliath and Gargoyles is the Frank Ferrillo, um, another Hill Street Blues reference uh, of that show. The whole show revolve, you know, he's the solid rock in the center that the show revolves around, and the show doesn't work without him. You know, one could also argue the show doesn't work without Brooklyn, or it doesn't work without Demona or Xantos, and I'm not really going to argue that point, but but Goliath is the center of that universe, and so it's hard to get past him. In terms of characters that were just flat-out fun to write, um, one that jumps to mind is G. Gordon Godfrey in Young Justice Invasion, um, <laughs> who, was, who was voiced by Tim Curry and who was just both a hoot to write and a hoot to record with Tim. Um, it was always so much fun. Tim took such relish in the character. Um, and, you know, he'd have us rolling on the floor almost literally. Um, and so that was always a great, fun character to write. Uh, uh, so I'm going to start with those two and, and, uh, and then say everybody else too, also. So, <laughs> They're all equally lovely. <laughs> uh, all right, well, that's going to wrap us up. Uh, so, Greg, thank you again. Everybody in the comments below, uh, if you, uh, this is, this is, I guess, the more spoilery, uh, you know, Young Justice talk, but, uh, if you have thoughts on any of these shows we've talked about, anything that Greg has worked on, uh, that you want to get your thoughts out on, anything like that whatsoever, uh, leave a comment about that. If you have future suggestions for Curblood topics, uh, related or otherwise, uh, leave a comment about that or hit me up on Twitter, Tumblr, Facebook, et cetera. Uh, Greg, what's uh, what's your Twitter and social media and stuff people people can follow you on? Uh, my Twitter is at Greg underscore Weissman, W-E-I-S-M-A-N. Um, and if you've got, you know, you want to touch base or you got a quick question, short question, um, Twitter's the best way to reach me without a doubt. I'm on Facebook. I don't understand Facebook. Um, <laughs> so you can try and friend me there and I'll say yes, but I, I, I'm not good at following Facebook at all. It's too complicated for me. Um, uh, but I'm on it. So in a theoretical sense, you can try and contact me through there, but it's not a good idea. Um, Twitter is much better. If you've got a question that requires a more sub substantive answer, uh, then your best bet is to go to askgregweissman.com. That's a website um, that I've uh, been maintaining uh, for over 15 years. Uh, it started as a place to ask questions about gargoyles, but I, it's since, you know, answer questions about Spidey or about Young Justice or anything else I've worked on. Um, there's a huge archive of answered questions there. I mean, immense. Um, and it's searchable. So the odds are if you have a question, whether it's about the business or about writing or about one of these many shows or even about individual characters, you can search the archive and find the answer without having to wait at all. Um, if you search the archive and you can't find the answer to the question you have, um, then that's what Ask Greg Weissman is for. So askgregweissman.com. Um, you can post your question there. I'll admit I'm about a year behind answering questions there, but I do get to all of them eventually. 
So, uh, again, that's why I advise just a short question, Twitter, it's more substantial, search the archive. Um, and if it, uh, and only actually post a question there if you really feel like you can't get the question answered any other way because I am a year behind. But um, eventually I'll get to it. All right, well, that'll do it. So uh, everybody, thank you for listening. Hashtag keep binging YJ. That's the first time I've spoken the hashtag aloud, but I can't stress that enough. Do that shit for me, for Greg, for everybody uh, who worked on these great shows. Uh, do it up and lend any support you can. Uh, thanks for listening. Greg, thank you again for being on, and we will catch you all next time. Bye.